on this episode of Conversations with Rich Bennett. The impetus of Kane was I had written another book uh, about the television world. Um, and, and in doing so, I interviewed a lot of, of news people, right? Uh, I was in sort of TV news, but I, and so this phrase kept on coming up again and again. Uh, the phrase being dog bites man, that's not a story because it's common. Man bites dog, that's a story. And that, and that phrase stuck in my head. Man bites dog, that's a story. And, and, and it's a common phrase. It's, it's a well-known news adage. But for some reason that rolled up into my subconscious and I started to think, well, what if I wrote that as a story? Man bites, bites dog. What would happen? And so man bites dog became man bites wolf. And then, of course, then it, he turns into a human. And that's how that sort of that genesis of that. And then something else in my head, and maybe because I'm Canadian, I guess, but I thought like, well, what kind of human would he turn into? He would turn into a big human, right? Because he's a big, powerful wolf. He'd be huge. So he's six foot seven. He's a big guy. But let me see. What else could he be? French Canadian. <laughs> so he turned into a six foot seven French Canadian. And that to me struck me as so fun and funny. I was like, yeah, that makes total sense to me. Coming to you from the Freedom Federal Credit Union Studios, Harford County Living presents Conversations with Rich Bennett. Come on, you you're faster than me. Guys. Hey, yeah. We've been together. Oh, man, you already said it. I was going to ask her. She remembered the dates. Thanks for joining the conversation where we explore the stories and experiences that shape our world. I'm your host, Rich Bennett, and today I'm thrilled to welcome Dick Wybrow, an acclaimed author known for his humorous supernatural thrillers. Dick's journey from a stand-up comedian and major market radio host to a best-selling author is as captivating as his novels. His celebrated Kane series, a favorite on Amazon, masterfully blends paranormal adventures with a unique comedic twist. With a life spent, I God, I can't wait to read this series now. With a life spent skirting traditional career paths, Dick brings a wealth of creativity, humor, and fascinating insights into the world of writing, humor, and the supernatural. So join us as we explore the depths of this imaginative storytelling and his experiences as an author. How's it going, Dick? Good, man, and uh, and greetings from Auckland, New Zealand. I am talking to you. From the future, because <laughs> I, I am I am a day ahead you of you. You are a day ahead of me. Wherever you are, I am in tomorrow. <laughs> uh, the trick is though here in New Zealand, we're not. We, you know, all everybody's going to sign something. We're not allowed to tell people what happens in, in their future. Um, but what I can so much say, for giving me the winning lotto numbers for tomorrow. <laughs> you know they're good. They're good. But I can't. We can't reveal it. Uh, I will say to you though, the one thing I can say is avoid Steve. Don't don't go anywhere. <laughs> avoid avoid Steve. That's not necessarily uh, a future. That's not necessarily a note about the future. It's just in general. Just avoid Steve. <laughs> I've had trouble with okay. Steve. Okay, this because I got a podcast coming up with a guy named Steve, so I guess I need to cancel. That. Maybe just you just kind of keep your distance. That's all I'm saying. Oh. There's something about Steve's. I don't know what it is. I'm sure they're lovely people, but some of them aren't. <laughs> So actually, when did you move to New Zealand? Because you're it, well, you're. Hey, correct me if I'm wrong. You're originally from the United States, then moved to Canada. Other way the around. Other way around. Other way around. Okay. So I was born. I was born in in Winnipeg. Uh, okay. Lived there till I was nine. Uh, lived in the United States for about thirty thirty five years. We moved here wow. eleven year, eleven years ago this month because I'm half Kiwi. My father is a New Zealander. And so there was oh. one point, there was one point here, like I'm saying, about eleven and a half years ago, uh, where I was working at CNN. It was kind of a I wasn't digging it anymore. I was looking for something else, mm-hmm. and I was googling around as you do, and I and I noticed something. I saw something on a website, and I went into my wife and I said, "Hey, it turns out I'm a citizen of New Zealand. It's called citizenship by descent because my father's New Zealander." I said, "So I've got citizenship," and she literally says, "Then what are we doing here?" That rich. That was October. By January, we were in country. That's what we did. Oh, wow. that's, how, that's how we move. Almost, almost like we were evading the the mob or something. We just got out, sold our stuff, gave away stuff, put what we had left onto a pallet, and shipped that over on a slow boat and hopped on a plane, and we came out here. Uh, and so, yeah, we've been out here for eleven years now. 
and beat all your furniture out there, didn't you? <laughs> well, we didn't have any furniture. We saw, I mean, because you, well, you I mean, know, the stuff that you packed up for the boat to go over. Take well, no, over. that wasn't furniture because you know you got you got okay. yourself that favorite chair of yours, but put that favorite yeah. chair and take that halfway across the world. That that uh, one hundred fifty dollars chair is now worth to three thousand so dollars. Twenty thousand yeah, dollars. No, no chair that. anymore. But bizarrely, <laughs> my wife. She she has her taste, things that she wanted to keep. And so she had a bunch of this flavored coffee creamer. This stuff was, it was over at Aldi's for like a dollar. And yet we just loaded up we had all this coffee creamer. What are they doing with all this coffee creamer? But I'll tell you what, now these days, man, I miss that creamer because they don't do coffee creamer in this country. You got to look around really? for it. Not really. It's not a thing so much. They do milk. They do milk in their coffee, which is horrible. But no, so uh, oh. so yeah, we we've been here for eleven years now. I, I cannot do regular milk in my coffee. I'm sorry. It's, now they it's they do. Just... It's funny because they'll go like, "Oh, you put cream in your cro- coffee, gross," and then they put whole milk in there. It's like that's borderline cream that there. No skim milk. Yeah, it's a big thing. Yeah, so it's pretty much whole milk because uh. this is a pretty ag- agrarian country. So straight out of the cow I... into the coffee. Yeah, I would have to mix that and just, I guess, go with the Bailey's Irish cream or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> something to thicken it up. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, the milk I'm not really into. They got something here called Milo, which supposedly is sort of healthy, like a malt drink. It's just chocolate milk. But they sort of, they couch oh. in this. But, you know, <clears throat> it's like your Wheaties, right? Wheaties is just, you know, it's, of course, Wheaties is, is just junk. <laughs> I mean, it's food, but it's, yeah. it's just breakfast. Food. And the same thing with Milo. They put somebody on there playing soccer, and that means that this is healthy. <laughs> right on their front cover, is somebody playing soccer or football, God. as they call it here. <laughs> look, it's healthy. This kid, he drinks it. And he, look how good he is at soccer. Um, so, no, but you go in any business here, and they got coffee, and they got a big tin of this Milo stuff. And you pour it there, and uh, you drink it all up. Yeah, it's not bad. Uh, it's all right. Like I said, it's kind of like a chocolate drink. All right. So, are you born in Winnipeg? Yeah, exactly. Spent thirty over thirty years here in the states. Yep. But you, before you got, and we were talking briefly uh, before we started because you were in radio and TV. But before yep. that, you were a comedian. Yeah, I did. So, when you were back in high school, what was your plan? What did you want to do when you got out of high school? Because you were I mean, you were a comedian first. Yeah, it's funny it was, because it, it, there wasn't a great desire to be a comedian. I loved comedy, mind you. You know, right. I was one of those hard rockers. I had the Iron Maiden t-shirts, the black ones with the sleeves ripped off. I was that guy. Uh-huh. But secretly, when I would listen to my cassette tapes, yes, cassette tapes. When I listen to my cassette yeah. tapes, I had Eddie Murphy and Bill Cosby and oh, Richard God. Pryor and George Carlin. All these guys are listening to whatever, you know, Slayer, whatever it is. Say, like, hey, what you got? Yeah. No, nothing. <laughs> I was the same way, man. Yeah. And so I would listen to that. So I fell in love with comedy. What I loved about it was the storytelling. And so then mm-hmm. when I got out of high school, I, I started setting uh, short stories out. I was doing a lot of writing. And and it, it, this is back in the day when you used to put what, uh, what's called an SASE, self-addressed stamp envelope. Mm-hmm. So you put a stamp on there. You put your address on there. You put that in your envelope with your short story. You send it out. So basically, when they reject you, you're paying for that rejection is <laughs> what that comes down yeah. to. And so wow. and, and this is pre-internet, right? So when you would send something out, you'd have to wait. Not weeks, not days, not hours, you months sometimes to hear back. And so it would t- it was a, such a long process. And so somewhere in my head, some somebody made sense of this and said, like, you know what? If I write something in the afternoon, because I, I could write stories or storytelling, if I got up on stage, I would be published that night. And so that somehow made sense to me. So I would do stories, jokes and bits, whatever, but I would do some storytelling on stage. And so that's how I got in a stand-up. It wasn't necessarily a great desire to be in front of a mic. It was just because right. that gave me an opportunity to get published that night. And so I write all these stories out, these these bits and stuff, get up on stage, and that's how I got in a stand-up comedy. Basically, a desire to do storytelling. Smart idea. It, it, it's it's Smart. a roundabout way to go at it. I, yeah. I, accept, I accept that. Uh, but yeah, no, it, it, see, it worked out for me. I did pretty well. I got a chance to tour with a bunch of comedians. I worked, uh, what, one of the, the last gigs I did was, uh, Dan Whitney, Larry, the cable guy. He and I did oh, a show. God, yeah. He's a good cat. Uh, we did a show in Melbourne, Florida in a bit like this, like this Chinese food restaurant annex right before he took off huge. And, uh, right. and I had, 
I had, a, I had a blast. Stand-up comedy. It was it was a really fun time. I had a really, especially in the beginning, you know, because you when you would come in and this would have been early '90s or so, and this is and you'd you'd do a show and people would be coming out to the clubs, and they weren't massive clubs, right? Maybe a couple hundred people, or whatever. Yeah. But you put all those people in one club, and you've just felt like you were in the Roman Colosseum. You're like, are you entertained? It was just <laughs> this amazing, just oh, it was an amazing feeling, and it was. It was, it was like like surfing because if you got got the crowd going, you would just sort of like float across the top of it, and and it was so much fun because they're on board, right? Everybody's there to have a good yeah. time. They spent their ten bucks or their two drink minimum, so everybody's there to have fun, and you're just the one leading them through it. And it was a, when it was really humming, man. It was no better feeling in the world. It was fantastic. Man, you need some great comedians there too. Yeah, I mean Bill Bill Cosby, Larry Larry the Cable Guy. I remember I, the first time I heard Larry, he was always coming on a local radio station here. Yeah, he, that's what he used Rock. to do. That's how I met him. Yeah, I, and I would be rolling. And then when they did the the uh, blue collar comedy tour, yeah, um, and then he came around here, and I went and saw him, and I I was in stitches, in stitches. I mean, you you can't. You, you can't stop laughing with him. You know, uh, and, and the same with all the other guys. And like you mentioned it, too, uh, for as much as, you know, Lair comes across as it's like, you know, um, and you used to do the whole bit of like, what the hell is this, Russia? You used to do that in the radio. <laughs> uh-huh. <clears throat> but he's got a real sort of casual, bumbling style. That dude worked yeah. his butt off. That guy worked harder than anybody else I knew. Because he would call in radio stations all around the country. He would be on uh, he would be on Rock 100 WDIZ in Orlando uh, doing mornings there. But he would call into stations all around the all around the country, and he would <clears throat> and he, that's how he got his name out there. Um, you know, some yeah. stations would pay him, some of them he would do for, for a while. But his he had his business model. I'm going to do this. I'm going to take advantage of this. And he just grew and grew his network until somehow within that Foxworthy guy heard him or something on the radio. Mm-hmm. And that's when it all took off. So he made that opportunity for himself. So for as much as he sounds like he's just like, you're kind of stumbling around. I'm just doing my thing. That is a smart, smart businessman, the way he does stuff. I t- and when they did that blue collar comedy tour, Larry reminded me of, he re- of Tim Conway. Oh, yeah. Tim Conway would do everything possible to try to get everybody else to crack up. I'm not talking about the audience. I'm talking about the people on stage with him or on the show with him. Larry's good at that. He would have Fox and Bill Engvall could not stop. Yeah. <laughs> Just kept rolling. Yeah, no, it was So great. how did you go from being a comedian into radio? So, um I, I, I luckily for me, and maybe it's fear driven. For the most part, I could always sort of see the writing on the wall. So when I was doing stand up, mm-hmm. um, everything was humming along really, really good. But then there were some, sort of fewer people coming to the clubs. Things were still going good, but like universally right. fewer people. Because what it was is television started to get this idea. All these TV executives, some of the worst horrible people in the world, <laughs> all the TV executives <laughs> went like, wait a minute. So instead of paying for scripted programming, instead of paying all these actors, I could put a microphone in front of a brick wall, put a guy or girl in between it, film that and put that on tv and that that's programming yeah. and that's what they did and so you saw stand-up shows on a and e and food network had a stand-up show at some point so it was all over television did they and, really yeah everybody did e- absolutely everybody wow. did yep and <clears throat> and so i started to see like listen at least for a period of time this is going to pull people away from the club so i got that's where i made the transition into radio and and I knew a bunch of people because I'd done a lot of radio as a, as a comedian. And so right. um, I ended up going to a broadcast school for about six or nine months or so and got a job down in El Dorado Springs, Missouri, um, doing country radio. Um, just two wait, and a half wait, what, hours. What broadcast in school? Uh, it was it's up in Minneapolis. I, God, I can't oh, remember okay. the name of the thing, but yeah. But no, it was it was Not good. the same when I went to. <laughs> <clears throat> no, there was like the Cleveland School of Broadcasting out there somewhere. But um, no, this one is uh, more of a local up there. But no, I ended up, in fact, so I went down there and it was a station that when I went there, I had to turn the station on in the morning. That's how small this station wow. was. Wow. Yep. It was a converted farmhouse. Right behind me outside the door was the tower. So the tower was out here and I had to go out and check the lights. 
because every hour you had to make sure the lights were on, right? But I was pretty sure I was getting hair cancer from that tower being so close to the back of my head the entire time. But yeah, I think it wasn't located at the crossroads, was it? (laughs) It was not at the crossroads, man. But I felt like I was at the crossroads sometimes because every now and then I get this weird feeling like I'll be doing the show and all this old circle pots and everything old school style. And because this was farm country, man, this but I would get this feeling of being watched and I must have picked up on it. But I took a look. I finally looked over at one point and there used to be these dusty, dirty blinds and swear to you, Rich. There was this eyeball staring at me through this little crack in the blinds. And I realized the cows would come in and they would watch through the window. And I don't know if they were looking for food. Oh, I don't know if they were. I don't know what it was. Maybe they were bored. But I had cows watching me through. And that's unnerving, the big cow eyes. And they wouldn't laugh at the jokes or nothing. They're terrible. They're the worst crowd. Cows are the worst crowd. I would never do shows in front of cows. Was that back during the mad cow disease? <laughs> you know, if they had been, at least had mad cow, they would have had a little bit of energy to them, man. They would they just were sit scooping and stare, your ass out, man. Stare at me, man. They would just <laughs> sit and glare at me. And so I did morning radio. And I couldn't go by Dick then, right? Because it was country music. Right. I did the morning show. And so we were talking a little bit about this before the show. And so the owner goes, no, wait a minute. You, you've got red hair. You, you do country in the morning. So we're going to call you Rooster. So I went by Rooster <laughs> at my first job. And so you can do all your jokes about the rooster and all that because I did too. But so, yeah, I did that for about a dozen years or so. Bounced all over uh, the United States doing radio. It was great. It was a, that was a fun time in radio, that mid to late 90s. Had a lot of fun. So what made you decide to get out of radio? Same thing. So uh, <clears throat> in about 1998 or so, um, they changed the rules of of radio to where you could own because there was a time when um like back in the back in the early days you could own like you know seven radio stations you could own two uh television stations and you could own one newspaper or something that's some sort of right. bizarre sort of rule setup and then i think it was 98 where they were in like let's get rid of all that we don't need any of that anymore deregulate and so they got rid of that and i'm a big fan of deregulation but what it did was then you got clear channel came in and this state these guys had like 1200 mm-hmm. radio stations within a couple of months uh, which is now iheart radio and it just get, got bigger and bigger and the problem with that was to be able to make the nut they needed to make their biggest expense was salary and so now you've got a guy yeah. out of Dallas doing afternoons in Atlanta, doing evenings in Cleveland. And so they're doing 12 different stations. And so, and you could see what's kind of watering down radio, but more importantly, all those, because back in the mid and late nineties or so, you had a lot of big shows it, and you see fewer and fewer of those shows around these days. A lot of them have yeah. gone to satellite, whatever it might be. And so I could see that that environment was changing that that you know what i was doing was becoming less valuable or if i wanted to keep doing it i had to do it in 15 different markets and so i bounced yeah. out i i got i got out right before the the bigger crash it, i think it killed a lot of people from wanting to get into radio because yeah. the jobs weren't out there anymore yeah and radio is a wonderful medium jobs. i mean of all the it things is, i've yeah. done i had so much fun i loved well, I, I did a night show in orlando um, and I had so much fun doing nights because for one, there were no bosses around. <laughs> yeah. I, that was the greatest, but it was, it was just you and that other person. I mean, th- this is, you know, this isn't the, the forties where we all sit around listening to uh, Milton Berle at night uh-huh. together. <laughs> it, it's, this is one-on-one. And so when you're talking to radio, like right now, odds are, uh, Rich, you and I are speaking to one person, listening on their headphones mm-hmm. or mowing the yard or driving in their car. And, and that's what I love about the podcasting is because it's that's all the great thing about radio was. It was a one on one relationship with the person listening. And, and that was one of the greatest things about radio, that relationship. And I had so many amazing listeners at that nighttime show in Orlando. That was one of my the most yeah. fun I ever had. I really, really loved it. Well, the funny thing is, with podcasts, and I saw uh, statistics, well, tw- for 2023, that uh, podcast listening had surpassed radio and TV. Right. More people listening to the podcast and watching TV or radio. I, I never I, thought that would happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised by that, especially because, um, you know, there's there's so much of it out there. Um, yeah. but. And it's, oh, it's yeah. like anything. There's there's so much of it. And eventually some of those p- 
people that are just kind of throwing darts in the dark start to fade away a bit and folks like yourself rise up to the top. Um, and yeah, I can definitely see that because I think that we have something called TSL, TSL time spent listening. And if you mm-hmm. had a TSL exceeding 20 minutes or so, you're killing it. Uh, in yeah. radio, but because a lot of people consume radio as they drove to work or whatever it might be yep. and podcasting, man, people listen to podcasts for an hour, an hour and a half. They, you know, you take a look at three some hours. Of, yeah. <laughs> some folks, man, there's a couple of those comedians who podcast three hours long. It's like, are you stoned yeah. three hours? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> but, well, you know, I think I, the thing is the the big difference between that and radio with radio, there was no, there's no pause button. Yeah. With a podcast, if you're getting into that conversation and you get to work, you got to go into work, you can hit pause. But, you know, and then you come know, back out and start again. And the other side is it's so segmented, right? Because back when yeah. that was always the complaint about radio. So back in the day, there's radio, there's top 40, easy listening, rock, and then became mm-hmm. active rock, and then became uh, album oriented rock, and then it became, you know, um, adult. Everything. Uh, album. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> segment and segment. And so podcasting has yeah. done sort of the same thing. I just talked to a couple of guys here in the last week or so, and these guys, they find obscure albums, music, and they mm. they talk about the music on the album. So here's one of these guys is talking about some Hungarian death metal album that, that we all listen to. And it's like, if you know what I mean? It, it was the sort of thing, like, if you are into obscure music, obscure rock, whatever, these conversations, uh-huh. you'll find it. If you have an interest in goats, you will find a podcast <laughs> talking about goats. If you're an interest in, in people who shave goats, there will be a podcast out there for people who shave goats. There will be. And so that is something really cool about podcasting <laughs> is you will, find, is. you will find your people. You will find your tribe. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because, you know, with mine, I mean, we're number one in the addiction category because we, we talk addiction a lot. Right. But I, I just like to have conversations, and somebody that I had on recommended that I get this military veteran on that has this beagle, and they like to go squirrel hunting. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, sure. First time I ever ate on the podcast, because he brought squirrel in. And I try. It's good, Dick. You gotta try this. It. Good. Yeah, you gotta uh, put it. You gotta get him. I've had it. I've had it. You gotta get into a brine oh. though. You gotta gotta brine it. Oh, he, this stuff was. He brought in the regular squirrel and squirrel quesadillas. It was one of the most <laughs> listened to podcast episodes. Squirrel quesadillas. That's what it means. Oh, that, see, that's yeah. you're not gonna get. You're not gonna get that anywhere else. <laughs> no. Squirrel quesadillas only happens in the podcast world. Um, exactly. I love it. All right, that's so great. you left radio. You get into yep. TV. Yeah. Uh, you were in TV for how long? Oh, what? was it 20 years? years, something like that. I don't know. I started okay. at CNN in 2000. I was I was doing a, a rock afternoon show in uh, Atlanta, and I had the option to go to work in Michigan potentially, or but my my kid. I, I had moved. I had a, I had three kids, and I'd move them because right. that's, what, that's what radio does. You move them, move, and it was his senior year of high school. And it might have been a bad oh, choice, but I was like, man. man, I just can't yank him out of school. I got to give him his last year because senior year is great if you've been there for a while. So I went to go find a different gig, and I ended up going and working at CNN. And I got into the radio side of what was uh, CNN, which eventually turned into right. television. But I hopped out of radio from there. Yeah. And, and I did that okay. at CNN for about, uh, yeah, for about 10 years there. Then came over here to New Zealand to keep up the TV thing. Uh, but you're not doing it TV anymore now, right? No, no. So about, um, and it's the same thing as we were talking about a minute ago, um, is, right. is I could see at least well, in the last couple of years, cause I, I watch all the numbers a bit. It's one of the things I do mm-hmm. do. I like the spreadsheets, uh, but I could see uh, television viewership was crashing and, and it would, it, and you know, it's 10, 15, 18% or so. And that may not seem like huge numbers, but do that over seven years, eight years, 10 years. Oh, and yeah. that is a dwindling audience. And so uh, I could tell as, as things were going on that, tv viewership or the entity that is tv because television can't quite work out how to do tv in the digital space it keeps trying to work it out yeah it's probably in reverse they probably need to find something in the digital space and chuck it up on tv because they they've been trying for 20 years to work this stuff out to, to get tv into digital so so i could see that and so about a year year and a half ago i've got i had another series going but about a year year and a half ago mm-hmm. i was like i gotta get this going because i think tv's fading 
uh, or TV was yeah. fading, but I think I was fading out. And so uh, as of December of this past year, uh, the show that we had on the air here in New Zealand, it was a top show. It had some of the best ratings the last 15 years, but they canceled the show. Uh, even though wow. the ratings were were uh, some of the best they'd ever seen in that time slot, they canceled the show just because of they couldn't find ways to take what we were doing. It was a live news comedy show with an audience. It was an expensive show to put on the air. They couldn't yeah. find ways to put us into the digital space, uh, which is what they're looking for these days. Wow. Yep. So now you're now here it is. You're a full time. I like to say authorpreneur. And yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but when, what, when was it when you actually started writing? Because I know you didn't start writing all these books once you left TV. No, I started writing when I was, uh, like a lot of folks, I started writing when I was really young. I was a real shy kid, you know. I, and when I came across, when you we were? came across, oh my gosh, yes. I'm still somewhat shy, to be honest. Uh, but yeah. when, we, when we came across from uh, Canada to the U.S., I was a chubby, redhead, nine-year-old Canadian. And that is a target. <laughs> and so I was I was a shy kid, man. I was a real shy kid. And so I would write a bit on occasion because if I couldn't make friends, I could make friends and create friends. And ah. so I create these stories, right? Um but but it only sort of turned humorous uh basically because at the time, you I mean you, you as a kid you're not funny. The kids aren't funny. They right. think they're funny. But it turned humorous because of pudding basically my writing huh? because I was sitting There's that Bill Cosby again. <laughs> it's a little bit of that, right? Because it's a pudding and it comes yeah. in with the jello, but no. So I'm, I was sitting there in, in my lunchroom. And so, like I said, this I'm in New Jersey. And so by myself at the lunch Wait table, a minute. Had, you in, in, in public school in New Jersey, dude, first place I came to redhead, chubby Canadian, red haired guy uh, sitting. Oh in, my God. So I, so it was aggressive. And so these three kids would come over and it would always be the same pattern. They'd say, what you got for lunch today? And, and they would, and I'd be, I, 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 and so they would take a look at what's in my bag and they would take my pudding out of there. And I tell you what, for a nine-year-old chubby little nine-year-old, like I was, pudding was my only friend and they were taking my yeah. friend away. And so one of these days when wow. they came on by, one of these days they came on by, I just flipped. I just flipped and I was like, well, I've got booger sandwiches and I got eyeball jerky. And I would just, just flipped. I'd never done anything like that before. Something in my head snapped. And, but here's the thing, Rich, right? So these kids laughed. They found it funny. It was gross out, but it was funny. And more importantly, they did not take my pudding. And that taught me so much. It was for one, <laughs> it was, you know, this is power, Right. Comedy, right. humor, humor has a fantastic way of like, if I've got you laughing and if we're sort of a bit of uh, antagonist, whatever, that's a power shift. I am now in control. Yeah. Uh, you, you are now, you are now uh, doing my bidding because <laughs> you're now laughing. Yeah. But no, basically it was, it was, it taught me in a short period of time, the voodoo of humor and not only the idea of uh, power shift, but also these guys started to like me a little bit more. It also created a scenario where I had to write jokes about my food, <laughs> right, you know, every every other day or so. If I want to keep my pudding, I had to come up with something. But they ended up becoming you know, sort of friends of mine. But that's basically is is my love of pudding sort of created this interest in humor. And and I had a lot of interest in, you know, in stand up and all that, even at that age, um, just the mechanics right. of comedy and that. But no, that was it. My love of pudding uh, created this interest in, in crafting humor. So, so you start writing about pudding. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So I, but I would just write stuff about that. But, and then that started to grow because as a kid, you know, especially nine, 10 years old, you still work on the world out. And I noticed yeah. this, this was something no one had ever told me about this, this. And I knew, of course we knew about humor. We'd seen television movies or whatever, even some bit of stand up. but I never felt that before that because I was a shy kid, I'd never felt that power yeah. shift before. And I didn't know what it was, but I picked up on something. There's something innate in there thinking there's something here that I like and something that I apparently have some ability to do. And so I just sort of honed that as I grew older and older, still a shy kid, but I would, I'd put that into the writing. And so I started to write uh, when I was, the first book I wrote was when I was 17. And, really? and yeah, I wrote a book at 17 and, 
and it was terrible. That should have been set on fire. It was an awful <laughs> book, but it was also, especially for people that are trying to write a book. And I know there's a number of folks listening that are trying to do that. Just get to the mm-hmm. end. That's a great feeling. Even if it's not great, just getting to the end of the book, you put a, the end at the end of it. I and mean, maybe it's only a hundred pages long, whatever, but so then that's what it, I wrote a very awful book and it took several more very awful books after that to be able to get to something where I felt as though I could actually present it to people. So are those books available still? No, thank God. So no. terrible. <laughs> but here's the thing. <clears throat> so because of, I had always been writing and I had done some screenwriting uh, and some teleplay writing because I was in Southern California doing radio for a while. And I actually got some interest with some of my stuff. But the, yeah, as things go, these things, you know, they get interest and then suddenly they fall down. They interest and then they fall down. And it wasn't until 2012 uh, when um, I was working at CNN at the time, I was coming home. I was kind of like, ugh, my job. And I said to my wife, I was, I was kvetching because at the time, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey was a big deal. Oh, and everybody yeah. was talking about Fifty Shades of Grey. And I was just like this. I mean, I, I'd read the excerpts. It's so awful. I was complaining. And I got nothing against uh, the, this, this, this writer. I mean, she found some amazing success with this. But I was convincing about it. And, and, and I started to say, you know what? Because at the time, there was all these like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies and Abraham mm-hmm. Lincoln Vampire Slayer. I said, I should take, I should make a zombie book out of, of uh, Fifty Shades of Grey and I'll call it Fifty Shades of Grey Matter because they eat brains. <laughs> you know, and to me, that was funny. But I threw it as, as a one off. And I said this to my wife and she goes, you should write that. And I was like, no, no, no one's going to read that. She goes, no, you should write that. Maybe somebody will actually buy this one. I'm surprised. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, okay. So I wrote it as a five part series and I put it up on Amazon 2012, the very early days of like some of the uh, uh, independent publishing. I put it right. up in September book one. I mean, whatever. There's, there's no advertising or anything. I just threw it up there. I got a couple of comments, put up book two. Then when I put up book three, and again, these are, it's one book in five sections. When I put up the third mm-hmm. part, it started to take off. And Rich, by, <laughs> by December, it became the number one comedy book on Amazon in December 2012. And I was like, what? That doesn't make any sense <laughs> to me. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I might have made $1,500 or something that month or something, but that was that was i felt almost free money i was getting paid for something yeah. i like to do but like i said it was the the top comedy book um and it, that one actually is still i wouldn't recommend reading it it's not great it's fun. is that the hell series no that's so the swordsman okay. i changed the name to the swordsman oh but, okay yeah okay. And, <clears throat> and then it took <clears throat> excuse me then it took a couple of years after that that I ended up doing hell inc Okay. But it's the same sort of thing. I learned each time I sort of composed this stuff. But that was really the first time I embraced some of this Gonzo style that I've got where it's just like anything goes. Um, because right. because before then, the stuff that I had some success with, I was writing to the market, thinking people like spy thrillers. So I wrote two thirds of like a trilogy, but I wasn't really having the fun with it. And if you're not having yeah. as much fun with it, it's not as much fun to read. I had a blast writing the swordsman or back then 50 shades of gray matter. And people picked up on that. And like with the hell Inc series, which I started 2018, uh, last book is coming out later this year. Uh, there'll be nine books in that series. I've had a blast with it. And it's, and it's insane. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's, it's a romp, right? And then Kane, which like I, you've mentioned, I started that in August. I mean, that's a gonzo idea. People seem to love it, but uh, it's a gonzo idea. Hey, listeners, meet your pet au pair, your pet care partner in Bel Air, Maryland. They're not just pet lovers. They're certified professionals dedicated to giving your pets the best care while you're away. Worried about leaving your furry friend with a neighbor? <laughs> with your pet au pair, worry no more. They offer peace of mind with their bonded, insured, and background check team trained in pet first aid and CPR for your pet's safety and comfort. Communication? They've got it covered. Quick and easy because your pet au pair knows your time is valuable. Starting is simple. Review the services, get a quote, and schedule a meet and greet. Visit com. That's B-E-L-A-I-R-A-U-P-A-I-R.com. And let your pet au pair be there for your pet when you can't be. Your pet au pair, doing it for the sits and wiggles. And they're all self-published? Yeah. They're all independently published, although um, Podium, after I put Kane out in August, it did so well um, that Podium Audio came around and said, listen, we want to turn this into an audiobook series. 
And so these guys are huge. These guys are huge. And so uh, coming up here on January 16th, the first Kane book comes out. I've got two amazing narrators and I can't wait to, I mean, it's fascinating, man. You think about that. I'm I'm in Auckland, New Zealand, and my domain is one quarter of a two car garage. (laughs) Because here in New Zealand, they carpet their garages, right? And not most people don't park in their garages, right? And so this is a room. So where I'm sitting right now, is one quarter this is my space one quarter of a two-car garage the rest of all this this belongs to my wife all of that is her space (laughs) my space is this one little quarter of a two-car garage but this thing that i wrote happy wife happy life (laughs) that's right man but this thing that i wrote like at four o'clock 4 30 in the morning before i would go to work at um at the television show i write this thing at four o'clock 4 30 in the morning in a two-car garage in, in auckland new zealand and now i've got these two trained Hollywood actors putting their talent behind this to create something beautiful. I can't wait, man. It's going to be so good. It's going to be so, so good. It's, it's exciting. It's a lot of fun. And it all, you know, it's funny because I think 10 years ago, maybe 10 years ago. So I would have hesitated about writing something like this, but thankfully uh, I've got narcolepsy (laughs) and with the narcolepsy, you sort of a bit in a bit of a dream state and you make choices that maybe other people wouldn't make. <laughs> and so in my head, yeah. in, in that narcoleptic haze, I was like, yeah, write that. That sounds like a good idea. Sure. Write a story about a wolf that gets bitten by a guy and turns into a human. And then when the full moon comes out, turns into a werewolf. But then when the moon is not full, turns into dogs. That makes total sense. <laughs> write that story. And I did. And so far it's going really well. <laughs> <laughs> okay with with these stories especially with the supernatural yeah um it, it, for some reason all i can think of now is that damn cow looking in the window at the radio station i, I think we're having sometimes i ahead. look over here and I, I did look over here sometimes and i wonder because i do have shades over here and I, there is a bit of a ah, i'm waiting for that big eyeball <laughs> to be staring at me through the windows yeah well, did you ever have like a paranormal experience or anything no, you know, I think it is. I think for one, it's a little bit about the license that that supernatural gives you to do anything um, within reason. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've got to stick within rules of storytelling. I mean, you can't right. like you sort of you, it's like like any other entertainment medium. You're making a promise to the reader or a promise to the listener. Right. You got to deliver. Right. So as I'm creating a story, yes, I could go off on a tangent left turn and make some crazy nutty choices. But you're making a promise to the reader that you will fulfill this sort of story arc and what you're doing. But aside from that, it's sort of anything goes. And, and I really was attracted to that. And I'm attracted to this idea about that. Maybe there's a little bit of magic in the world. Right. For as much as because I'm because mm-hmm. I, I, I took physics uh, in the one year college and I'm going to I like <laughs> science and physics and all that. And and I believe in what I can see. But I have a real I, I, I do have part of me that thinks that there's a little bit of magic in this world that we don't quite understand that we can't really put our hands around. And every now and then we get a bit of a taste of that, don't we? Every now and then there's some yeah. like way that is that's something I can't explain. How did this happen? How do those that confluence uh, those moments come together. And so I guess that's me in the supernatural world, sort of embracing this idea that there's, you know, because the books aren't, there's no magic spells and fairy dust and wizards. There's none of that stuff. Yeah. There's a werewolf guy in there, but who turns into dogs on occasion. But, you know, aside from that, 90% of it is just your everyday people trying to get through life and working stuff out. And there's just that little bit of magic in there. Um, and all my stories are pretty much that way. They're just people trying to get by. Usually people that are sort of ones that, that seem like they're regulated, right? People like, you know, Amelda right. in, in this story, she's a former criminal, criminal, maybe not former, maybe not so former, but she, <laughs> she used to be a getaway driver and she becomes his driver because uh, she's trying to get away from this crime family. And here's Kane. And he's like, you know, like as I mentioned, he's a wolf that turned into a human who's looking for this person who bit him so he can turn back into a wolf. So these are people you would not expect much from. And they come together, though, and they're a little bit like my other series. But when they come together, these sort of broken sort of people, they can do amazing things together. And and it, I find that a lot of fun. Uh, wow. <laughs> I, cannot, <laughs> I cannot wait for this. You mentioned narcolepsy. Yeah. Do you think that's actually helped with yeah. your writing? I do. <clears throat> it's funny because there's a lot of different types of narcolepsy. There's some people that have uh, cataplexy right. to where... 
uh, if they hit a, like a strong emotional state or if you scare them, they'll actually lose. I mean, they'll lose their muscle tone and they'll actually slide down to the floor. That's pretty dangerous. Thankfully, I don't have wow. that. And my heart goes out to people that do have that. I'm just I'm just sleepy all the time. Um, somebody once somebody in one of these narcolepsy forums I'm in said, like, for people who don't understand narcolepsy, stay up for 30 hours, 30 hours. And I'll go to work. <laughs> and come home, make dinner, Jesus. and then sit down and talk to your spouse. And so, you know, so like when I'm talking with you, Rich, I got to make sure I stay laser focused because I could easily drift off and suddenly I'm not listening anymore because my mind wanders. Right. It's something I've got to do. And not, not, nothing against you. You're a great host. It's just me, myself. But as you, as you mentioned, I do find... Um, I do find it as a superpower. I really sincerely do. Yeah. Because like, for example, when you lay down at night and you're about to go to sleep, do you ever get those, those ideas come in, the ideas start flowing and you're like, wow. Absolutely. Is, yeah. And you think like, man, that yes. is a great idea. I got to write that down. Then you wake up the next morning and you can't remember what it is and you didn't write it down. Yep. So, <laughs> but that yeah. state of mind, I'm in there 80, 85% of my day. You know, I take medicine and all wow. that, but I'm, I slide into that state of mind. And so I think that that zone, that dreamlike state that I'm in most of the day, I think helps with the creativity. And so I am, wow. I embrace it as a superpower. I see narcolepsy as something that is driving my creative process. You know what? Good for you. I, I, and I'm, I'm glad that's the case. I just had three young ladies on who written books. All yep. three have dyslexia. Wow. And Yeah. But they didn't let it stop them. Yeah, no. and two of them actually run, uh, started and run nonprofits. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think so it's too. yeah, it's a sort of thing that you know either you can sit and go like, oh, this sucks. I've got this endless and narcolepsy ain't the worst thing in the world to have out there. It's it's frustrating. Right. But um, so all I can do is is try and use it to my advantage. And I think I think I'm right. I think it's working. <laughs> I think because. Yeah. Because they're they're crazy they're crazy stories and supposedly funny people seem to like them. Actually, can can you describe a moment uh, during your writing when a character or even the plot took an unexpected turn? Man, I I have a very small example. It's my favorite to use. I think because it's so small. Um, uh -huh. Because when I'm when I'm writing and if you're and if you're really in the zone, the characters start to make decisions for you. And I know how nuts that sounds. I know how flaky that sounds. But I'll give you an example. So <clears throat> in my other series, I had two characters were sneaking into like this Facebook headquarters sort of thing, right? The evil, <laughs> evil sort of headquarters. They're sneaking in. And the only way they can get in is this underground tunnel. And then the floor is electrified. So they can't touch the floor or they die. So what they decide is the two of them get on top of these, you know, the Roombas, the, the motorized vacuum cleaners. Oh, <laughs> and they're riding these Roombas underneath across this floor because they can't touch the floor. They're going to die. Right. So here's the idea. But so that was the plan. That was what was in my head. But then suddenly one of the characters decides, wait a minute, I want to get ahead of you. And the other one goes like, no, I want to get ahead of you. And they turn this into a race. So this was oh, not geez. the plan. This was not the plan. But as these two characters are going under here, they decide that, yeah, there's death all around. They, they touch the floor. They're going to die. They're going to this evil lair. One, like, throws his sock up in front. And so the Roomba chases after the sock. And he goes farther. And the other one throws something up. But they made that choice. The characters <laughs> made that choice to turn that into a race. I didn't go into that thinking it was going to be a race. But the characters themselves, in my head, in that subconscious, in that little bit of magic in the world, or whatever it might be, decided that this is going to happen. And it ended up being a fantastic scene. Not by design. I just sort of almost transcribed what was coming out of, out of my subconscious. It was great. But no, yeah. I, and there's moments like that all through the writing. But that's a nice little yeah. simple one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, all right, this has got to become a damn movie. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. You know, there is some interest in 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 Kane. Uh, there's some interest of. Uh, we'll we'll see what happens with that. I want to put a, a kibosh on it, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see. It, uh, It'll happen. It'll definitely happen. I, I yeah. think it will. Yeah, people seem to well, dig have it. You actually, know? Have you actually come up with the characters? Is it, I I mean, all of it can't be from a vision you had while sleeping or something no I, I i think like for example with the cane i had the impetus of cane was i had written another book uh, about the television mm -hmm. world um and and in doing so i interviewed a lot of, of news people right 
Uh, I was in sort of yeah. TV news, but I, and so this phrase kept on coming up again and again. Uh, the phrase being dog bites man, that's not a story because it's common. Man bites dog, that's a story. That's and that, different. <laughs> and that phrase stuck in my head. Man bites dog, that's a story. And, and, and it's a common phrase. It's, it's a well-known news adage. But for some reason that rolled up into my subconscious and I started to think, well, what if I wrote that as a story? Man bites, bites dog. What would happen? And so man by saw became man by 12. And then of course, then it, he turns into a human. And that's how that sort of that genesis of that. And then something else in my head, and maybe because I'm Canadian, I guess, but I thought like, well, what kind of human would he turn into? He would turn into a big human, right? Because he's a big, powerful wolf. He'd be huge. So he's six foot seven. He's a big guy. But let me see. What else could he be? French Canadian. <laughs> so he turned to a six foot seven French Canadian. And that to me struck me as so fun and funny. I was like, yeah, that makes total sense to me. And that, and that's what I mean. And so then from there, I think it gets in the subconscious and he starts cooking. And then you start to think it from the wolf's perspective. So he was a wolf just a few weeks ago, months ago, just a year ago. So how would he view the world? How would an animal view the world? And now you're starting mm. to get some of his personality, how he views some of the things that humans do as confusing or as strange, or they don't quite make sense. And so that starts to create a bit of a personality in him. You know, and then of course he was a wolf. He was an alpha wolf, and what's cool about wolves is they're they're alpha pairs. It's male and female are pairs. They're together. So he's got a wolf right. wife. He's got a wolf wife who's waiting for him. That's why he wants to get back to his pack because his wolf wife is is you know waiting for him. She may not be waiting for him anymore. Who knows? But so then, <laughs> but he was an alpha wolf at the time, and so the character is like maybe he's going to be arrogant. So you got a six foot seven French Canadian man used to be a wolf. He's a little bit arrogant, got a bit of a swagger to him. But then as the story progresses, you realize that he hadn't always been the alpha wolf, that he came in after another alpha wolf ended up getting killed. So he sort of sees himself as second best. He can't quite get that out of his head that, yes, he was alpha, yeah. but he wasn't first choice alpha. He was. And so that's what I mean. As you progress and create and all these bits and pieces start to come in, now you've got this six foot seven French Canadian alpha wolf who has a bit of a insecurity, even though he comes across with a swagger who views humans in a particular way from an animal point of view. And you're creating the character right there and you're creating this entire <laughs> mind around it. And it's it's fun. It's really fun to do. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, man. So, <laughs> just six foot seven and and it's it's I, funny because you also need the foil right or to some extent right so so yeah. he's people really find him him pretty funny and then i've got imelda who is a you know a smart talking but a street smart um and she's sort of, even though she's sort of the criminal former criminal that's so former criminal she's the one kind of keeping everything on the straight and narrow so she's got to keep him in check because because okay. he he's got a big thing where he he's an animal, right? Former animal. As so he doesn't he says animals don't lie. So he'll walk right in and someone will say something to him. He says, "Oh, you're a big guy." He says, "Why well, I'm wolf?" And he's like, "No, no, like snay. Say, don't say that to people." So she's constantly <laughs> trying to make sure he doesn't say something to get them, you know, to eyeballs on them. So yeah, no, it's fun. That's <laughs> yeah, fun. Actually, actually, what do you believe is the key ingredient in uh, creating stories that resonate with readers on a humorous level? I th I think humor is about interaction between people. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. write jokes, right? It's about interaction between people. Something as similar as somebody brought this up to me just the other day. Um, like there's a moment when uh, Kane goes into a car show um, uh, in, uh, it would have been Minneapolis probably. Yeah. He goes to a car show right. in the Minneapolis area and he walks up there and, uh, and he, you know, he's got a bit of an accent. He's there with Imelda and the woman behind the counter says, I'm like, oh, where are you from? And he, uh, she said, oh, he's French Canadian. And then she looks up and goes, oh, we love to have people here from overseas. And so it's, <laughs> you know, that's it, that all comes from the interaction. That all comes from interaction, you know. And it, it's not just here's a comedy joke. It says that says so much about her and then so much about them. And that's where the fun is, right? It is is sort of the fun in character, not in just right. the fun wordplay. It's, it's, it's the fun interaction between characters. How, well, how do you balance the elements of suspense and comedy in them? Um, the you can't. It's it's a big thing. And I learned this sort of in radio, you know, uh, you've got to keep you've got like we said, you, you have uh, an obligation to the reader to keep the story going. 
And there's that, that mm-hmm. old line from, I think, Ernest Hemingway, kill your darlings. Yeah, this might be a great joke. It might be a great moment. This might be hilarious. This might be the funniest line ever written. But if it doesn't fit into that storyline, if it doesn't fit into that character, save it. Give, give it to somebody else. Yeah. You know, put it off to the side. And so the balance is the story comes first. The characters come first. The humor is there, but I never sacrifice the characters or the storyline for the humor. And that takes a bit okay. of a discipline. Because <laughs> sometimes yeah. you're like, oh, it's such a good joke. That's such a funny moment. But if it doesn't quite fit, it's got to go. And you can use it somewhere else. You know, you'll, you'll come, if it's really, really good, it'll come up somewhere else. Uh, the third book in Kane just came out, right? Yeah, Decide, it just came out December? And, yep, mm-hmm. in the last, okay. uh, last week or so, yeah. So with this series... Well, actually, I would say it's probably all your books except for the ones you wrote when you were 17. You don't want anybody yeah. to read, so you burned them. Uh, <laughs> who would you say is your ideal reader for this? It's Besides t- practically everybody, because I can see people laughing their ass off. You know, that's the thing. It's it's tough. It's so funny, man, because if I would have picked, because you assume your ideal reader is someone like you, right? I mean, because right. you're sort of writing it for yourself. But I've got readers in Canada, America, Australia, uh, UK. In fact, I had a woman in UK, one of my ideal readers, I guess. A woman in the UK ended up influencing the third book because of something she said. Because every now and then I'll do like this in a way. I'll do Zoom calls with reader groups. Like a bunch of folks will get together, mm. they would read it, and they'll reach out and say, hey, listen, you mind? Could you talk with us? Say, sure, of course. And so that very morning I was, I was starting the third book, right? I was writing and I was just struggling. I had sort of some of the basics. I couldn't quite, something was kind of missing. I wasn't having, uh, I didn't have the essence of it or something. So I put that aside and I'm talking to these folks in the United Kingdom. And this woman from, I always say she's from New Brighton. I don't know if that's what she said. I don't know if it just sounds like a cool place. And if you're from New Brighton, you know it, you're probably laughing at me because maybe it's, it is not a cool place. I don't know. But anyways, the woman from New Brighton. So again, I was struggling that morning trying to work out some of the bits and pieces for book three. And she says, I can't wait. I'm not going to do the accent. I will not do it. But she (laughs) says, I can't wait to find out more about Cain. Because Cain, when he turned from a wolf into a human, he was originally like a teenage boy. You know, for that year, he Mm -hmm. grew into this, you know, 25 year old or so human. He grew up very fast. But for that year, he was raised by this French Canadian couple. And so I didn't get into a whole lot of that. And so she said, I can't wait to find out more about his time on the farm with this French Canadian couple and when he was growing up and how he learned how to be human. And I said, that's exactly what I'm doing in book three. (laughs) It's funny you say that because that's my plan of what I have to do the plan for book three of what I'm doing. And that's what I mean. She, (laughs) at that moment in time, and that to some extent, Rich, man, that's a little bit that magic in the world. Because I needed some sort of inspiration. I couldn't quite get my head wrapped around it. And uh, here's this uh, this woman from New Brighton who says, you know what? I I want this. And I went, that's exactly what it should be. That's exactly where I should be going. So through the thread of the third book, we find out about how he made this transition and some of this great wisdom and advice that this couple gave to him, this older couple gave to him. And it's really lovely and emotional in some parts. It was really really fascinating journey to take and and a lot of that Kaya was inspired by her and so i i thanked her for that and gave her a copy and everything and but no it's uh it's been a, it's it's been an amazing back and forth with readers um there would have yeah. been a time even not that long ago 20 years ago or so 15 years or so ago when people put stuff out and then maybe people send in mail to Dean Koontz or, or, or yeah. uh, whoever it might be, Stephen King. But these days, I get readers contacting me all the time on email or Facebook, whatever it might be. And I love that That's interaction. That's great. Yeah, it is. It's yeah. really positive. They're really great. I've got amazing readers. They're so fantastic. And, and and a number of them have become pretty good friends to where I end up sending early copies. Some people can say, hey, how does this sound to you? That's what's called beta readers. You send out early yeah. copies and it's not even like, Hey, make this better. It's like, does this make sense? Does this all make sense? Does, is there something? Cause some of my readers know my stories better than I do. Cause I move on to the next story. Say, Hey, well, listen, that one character you said was from here and wore this, but had this is like, Oh, I don't even, okay, cool. I'm glad you mentioned that because I need to change that back. <laughs> but no, they've been great. The interaction with readers that is for all the negatives we might have in the social media age and all that. That is one of the most lovely things in my world right now is that interaction with these people who are very likely will never meet, but are very close to me. Yeah. So how, 
how many different writers groups do you actually belong to? Uh, you said that was done through Zoom, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that wasn't a writers group. That was just that's one of those where oh, I'm sorry, a group of readers will get together. And they'll they'll read the book like uh, and I can always see it like you know, I'll see a burst like a book like, club exactly right yeah okay, so book okay. book clubs will get together and then they'll contact me and I've done that a, a dozen times or so I have, uh, yeah a dozen times or so yeah and they'll That's contact me and, and I'll zoom into it and I'm always willing to if if, if you got a group of folks that have read it and want to chat about the books yeah I'm always up for that uh, but that's been <laughs> great uh, but what it's funny you mentioned that Rich because when it comes to writers groups. I, it's so solitary here. And I don't know for people that are listening, if you're a writer, I know a lot of people get a lot out of that. I'm not yeah. great with social interaction. I think I, I like okay. my little room and I actually don't belong. I lurk in one or two of them, but I actually don't have aside from writer friends, a couple of them, my version of friends, right. I email them once every six months and they email me once every six months. <laughs> but I don't have a lot of other interaction in writers groups for the most part. It's readers. I speak to a lot of readers. Yeah. So as an author, what's, you know, when you start writing or even in the middle of it or towards the end, what's one of the biggest challenges you face? Um, I think for me, sometimes a challenge is just every time I start a new book, because I've just started book four here in the last week or so. And I should almost write it down because every time I start, every single book I've started, and this is like book 15 or 14 or something, whatever I've written, I go, every time I go, I'm no good at this. I, uh, I'm a terrible writer. <laughs> every <laughs> starting a book is tough. It's just one of those, every single time I, you, you get that uh, imposter syndrome, right? Like, what am I yeah. doing? What do I think I'm doing? And so you got to get through that inertia, that initial inertia, and then you're flying. That's one of the hardest parts is to keep going. And right. I know how, and I know we've, you've got, you got listeners that are struggling to write the book is it just push through it. Your, your goal is to get your clay together because your first uh -huh. draft is going to suck. It's just, they all first drafts suck. Just get the clay together. I'm writing stuff right now. I know that it's not going to make it to the end, but if you get all your clay together, you get your, you get your lump together and then you can make it better afterwards. And that's the trick. And so right now I'm writing my lump. <laughs> I'm writing my lump. And so I'll get my 90, 100,000 words or so. Um, I do about 3,000, 4,000 words a day, sometimes 8,000 words, depending on how things are flowing. Wow. Get that done. And then you come back and revise it. And, and again, I'm really encouraging. I, I know there's somebody listening right now. Here's a bit of the magic, right? Here's the magic we were talking about. There's a reason why you're listening to this podcast. You, 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 the person listening right now, hearing this, I'm talking directly to you. You're hearing this because you've been trying to write that book and you can't finish it. Now, this is what you need to do. Just do it. Just write. Don't don't go back and edit as you write. Don't don't go back and do this. You need to. This is why you're hearing this now. Just push through and get to the end. And once you've got all that clay, then make it better. You're going to write scenes you're going to cut later. You're going to write dialogue you'll never use. But just push through and get to the end. And that's how you finish your book. Don't listen to anybody else. Just finish it. So there's my inspiration to that person. There's that one person hearing I it love that. that needs to hear that. But that's what you do. You get to it. And then once you get that mass of clay, you just sort of you mold it and take all the stuff out that doesn't look like a book four. And then you're good to go. So with you, because you're, you're self-published. Yeah. Uh, you, you say you're not great in social settings. No. Right. I think part of that, I, I will accept I, part of it is because of the narcolepsy. Because after, okay. after a few minutes, I do get tired. Okay. What, how do you actually, besides getting on podcast, what's your biggest, uh, the biggest way that you market your books? That, so, or I should say the most successful way that you've been marketing them besides so, podcast. Uh, social media, a little bit of that. Um, I've got okay. some amount of editing skill when it comes to stuff. Like, for example, uh, it's funny. So, so Podium is, has put this uh, audio book together, which I'm stoked about, like I mentioned. It comes out on the 16th. Yeah, First I one can't comes wait for that. So, but, so I went to Podium. I said, hey, listen, I want to talk to the narrators. They're like, why do you want to talk to them? <laughs> so I want to interview them. <laughs> for what? It's because I want to take the interview and I want to make little pieces of it for social media. I go, oh, well, no one's ever done that. That's a great idea. Like, oh, yeah. And so what I did is I got on Marie McCann and Tim Campbell and I interviewed them like you and I are speaking now. And I'm taking bits and pieces of those and putting them out. I'm putting and put another one out here in the next couple of hours. And it's just, and part is to talk about the book, also talk about the amazing work they do. But that sort of thing, I think yeah. it's just coming up with some ideas that are a bit different, things that I like to do that I find fascinating. Um, but I'll be honest, 
<laughs> what has driven this book has been my readers. And I am so thankful, man. I am so thankful. I've got a, a newsletter list that I've got some folks right. on there, which is fine. They're great. But it's just been this word of mouth. I, there was just a post here this morning. Sorry. There's just a post here this morning um, that, of, of woman saying, <laughs> saying like, a friend of mine knew, uh, I wish I could remember, she, a friend of mine knew that I liked unusual books and told me about this book. I started reading and went back to her and said, you've got to read this too. Now we're both reading. And that's, that's the marketing I've got. Wow. Yeah. So I've got somebody, you know, it's just word of mouth. It's just people, other people hearing it about, uh, about the story from other people. And that's one of the most powerful things in the world. You can put up ads and you can put up social media posts. You can put up your cover all over the place. You can do podcasts like yours. But mm. really, in the end, it comes down to if a friend of yours says, hey, I checked this book out and I loved it, you're going to check the book out. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, something very important. Tell everybody your website and where they can find your books. It's just my name. It's dickwybrow.com. Um, all my books are uh, on Amazon. If, if you're a big, like, or don't like Amazon, um, you can actually, you can pick them up. You can pick the paperback up from, like, uh, Walmart, Barnes & Noble, a bunch of different places. Yeah, it might have to go in and have them order it in, but they can order that uh, right. paperback in. Um, and then, like I said, I'm really stoked about the first three books in the series are going to be, uh, like I said, turned into audiobooks. They've been turned into audiobooks. First one coming out January 16th, which I'm stoked about. I cannot wait for that because that's, be I mean, that's the main main way I do read books now is by yeah. Audible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Know, for, yeah. As much as I work around, uh, especially because doing the full-time author thing, which means I'm going to do a lot of stuff around the house <laughs> because the wife's like, you don't have a real job. It's like, so last year, yesterday I was like washing the car. I was doing the love yard. And as I do that, I listen to audiobooks. So yeah, no, I do too. I They're great. I think my there to wash the car right now is going to freeze. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it's summer here, man. It's well, allegedly summer. It's been raining every day since last January, but allegedly it's summer here in New Zealand. All right, Dick, go ahead. Rub it in. Yeah. No, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's tough to get used to, though, right? Right now, my temperature says it's 16 degrees. To you, that's cold. To, to me, I think that's just about 60. Oh, 16 degrees Celsius. Yeah. It's the okay. Celsius here. Here, you want here, here. Well, I know we're going, but I'll give you a little bit of learning. Here's a fast trick to be able to do Celsius to Fahrenheit, because I still do the conversion in my head. You double it and add 30. Basically, basically, that's how it works. So if the te really? temperature says 15, double it to 30, add 30 is 60. So 15 is about 30. It's round about that. Oh, it's sure. Round, so easy, it's real rough, but it gives you a bit of an idea about how cold it is. Because I don't know what, when they say it's 10, 12, 15, 20, I don't, I don't know what those, those numbers mean. Even to this day, I've been here 11 years. But, but I, I do it in my head. I go, oh, it's about 60. It's about 65. It's about 70. It's right. about 80. Yeah. Double I'm glad three. you told me that because a lot of these videos I'm writing or watching for recipes, if they're from England or whatever, oh. it's always in Celsius. I'm yeah, like, well, don't do that for recipes <laughs> because those are pretty exact. Do you know what's funny, though? All the sort of like significant chefs, a lot of the significant chefs use Fahrenheit because there's more numbers in there and you get more exact. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just throw it on the grill. It makes it easier. Yeah, your best, it's your best, it's your best bet. Before I get to my last question, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I've really enjoyed the time with you, man. And and I do want to reiterate to, to the folks that are trying to write a book of, you know, get out there and do it. Just just finish it. Just finish it. Don't worry so much. Just keep writing. Push through that insecurity because I get that insecurity every time I write and push through it and make it happen. Yeah, you know, thanks for saying that, because that's uh, I started writing one last year and I just been I haven't touched it in a couple months it's just fear man yeah. it really is it, yeah. it, it, and i got it i got it every single time i write just push through it it's such a joy just to be done with it if nothing else you can say hey i've written a book how many people you know written yeah. a book just do it I, i'm going to matter of fact i am going to work on it this weekend because you told me to do it brother man <laughs> no, and i want to read my, it i want to read it when you're done shoot it at me I, if my mentor calls me he's going to ask me how come you haven't been writing and he's going to yell at me <laughs> so I don't want that to happen. <laughs> so you've been on several interviews. I have. And I love asking people this question. Is there anything that a host has never asked you that you wish they would have asked you? And if so, what would be that question and what would be your answer? Uh, it doesn't it, necessarily have to be about the books or writing. Yeah. Anything a host has never asked me. Uh, um, I would say... Um, I guess, I mean, the hard part is like a lot of folks ask about inspiration. People love talking about inspiration. Um, but I, I think one of the, 
I guess maybe a tenant, right? Maybe a tenant in my life mm -hmm. is something that's actually outside of writing. Something that sort of that I try to live by as, as best as I can that has nothing to do with writing. In fact, it's just the opposite of all the stuff we're talking about. Uh, because I did stand-up comedy and radio, and that's always about talking, and this is me now, right? right. I mentioned earlier about humor. But one of the sort of uh, – a tenet I try to live by as much as I can is to shut up, me, to shut up and listen. Because it's so important to listen to somebody. Uh, we forget the, the insane value there is in just listening. Not listening in hearing and like waiting for their lips to stop moving so that we can say our thing. But we forget the extreme value there is in just listening to somebody and what they're into at that moment. And if nothing else, in a selfish way, if you were to go to a party and just listen to somebody and ask questions about whatever they're into, you might say a dozen words. That person is going to walk away from the party and go, that was an amazing conversation. <laughs> They'll yeah. love you for it. But it's just it's such a gift to give to somebody to really listen to what they're saying, pay attention with no agenda. And you'll find that that actually makes you feel really good, too, because you can feel that joy coming off them because we don't listen to each other anymore because we're so busy trying to get yeah. our thing in there. Here's my social media post here. Let me jam this down your throat. But so I guess my thing is like as best as I can, I try to live by this tenet of when I meet somebody new, I want to just as much as I can be into what they're talking about in that moment, whoever they are in that moment, because you can feel the joy coming off them because we just don't do that enough for each other anymore. So I would, yeah. if I could give any suggestion, just give it a shot. You might do it already, but just you meet somebody in the street, talk to a neighbor, don't put your thing in. You make a point, you put your stuff aside and just whatever they're into, be into that. And you'll see that. You'll see that joy in their face and that light up and it makes you feel great. And you could be helping them yeah. as well. Because uh, you, you know, never know, that person could be having a bad day. 100%, man. And you could turn all that mm -hmm. around just by listening. Not trying to solve any problems, just by listening to them. Yeah. And you could learn something as well. Yeah, of course. Good for yeah, you. don't you, to learn anything. You don't learn anything by flapping your gums, man. No, no, exactly. Dick, I want to thank you so much. I cannot wait for these to come out on Audible because I am dying to listen to them. Uh, everybody listening, make sure that you get not just the Kane series, get all of Dick's books. And after you read them or listen to them, make sure you leave a full review. Oh, yeah. Because that. that's definitely going to help him sell more books um, and more awards as well. Yeah, you know, yeah. We'll he, see how we go. He needs to remain. He needs to stay that award-winning author. <laughs> Got to make it happen, man. Yep. Thank you, Rich. I appreciate it, brother. Really enjoyed the time today, man. And and I hope it warms up where you are. I don't think come January though. I can't imagine you're going to see heat or the sun anytime in the next three months. I want to thank my guests for coming on this episode, but I really want to thank you for listening. And I would really appreciate it. If you left a review about the show or about this episode, and you can actually do that right from the website, go to conversations with rich Bennett.com. You can leave a comment about this episode. You can leave a review for the podcast in general. Another thing I would love for you to do, of course, follow us on social media, but send me a voicemail. If there is somebody you want me to get on the show, if you want to come on the show, if there is something you would like for us to discuss, send a voicemail or send an email. If you send a voicemail, if you want, I can actually play it back on the show too. So just saying, uh, but no, seriously, I, I want to thank you for listening because if it wasn't for you, the podcast wouldn't be as successful as it is. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. Celebrating 10 years, and there's a lot of good things going on this year with Rage Against Addiction. So I am sitting here with Wendy, the executive director, the founder of Rage Against Addiction. And we have something big coming up this year. The Memory Walk, was it the Memory it's Walk 5K? Mem it's Memory Walk Recovery Run. It's Rage Against Addiction's Memory Walk Recovery Run 2024. Uh, this is our biggest fundraiser of the year. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and our mission is to provide awareness and support to anyone that struggles from drug and or alcohol abuse. And this event brings together um, a, a large variety of people, um, those who have lost loved ones to the disease of addiction, and also we celebrate those in recovery. So this 
5k is um, a run. And we have a lot of runners who are running um, to support recovery. We have runners that run in memory of a, a loved one that is no longer with us. And then we have a really large group of family members that come out, bring photos of their loved ones and just celebrate them and just try to bring some awareness to the disease. Uh, this supports our programs. We have sober living houses in Bel Air, Maryland for women. And we also have some other programs that support uh, new moms in recovery. Uh, we support uh, kids by being a resource broker. And we've done some funding throughout the years to help people get into sober living. So so this is this is a big deal for us. This is the the event that brings a lot of awareness to the community. It brings awareness to all that we're doing. And like Rich said, it's our 10th anniversary. So we we really want to let you know that we're here to stay. And the reason that we're doing what we're doing so well is because of all of the support in the community. And so we we, we welcome you to to join us. You can also join us virtually through the entire month of April. April uh, 1st through the 30th, we have a virtual event. And then the 13th is our actual in-person event at Cedar Lane Regional Park in Bel Air. You can register through our website, which is www.rageagainstaddiction.org. You can find all your info there. Uh, it'll take you to run sign up. You can create a team. You can do some um, independent fundraising with your family in memory of your loved one. And we also welcome sponsors. Sponsors get a place on our website. Your logos will go there. We give a shout out at the event. We're going to have some speakers from our alumni which is really what's near and dear to my heart. And again, it's, you know, it brings us all together and, and we hope that you can be there. Uh, now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The run is a 5k, but you can also walk it, which is what? One mile. We, we have um, a route that goes around Cedar lane uh, regional park. They have a, a path. And when you do the 5k, you, you do two laps. Our walkers okay. tend to do one. So it's like half, you know, it's probably like, okay. It's probably like a, a mile, a mile and a little. Yeah, I can do the wall. You don't have to be here to participate. And we encourage that because we know that no family is immune and addiction, unfortunately, isn't going away. And we have a new uh, up and coming generation that was plagued by COVID and we're seeing the youth population really struggle. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure yep. that they continue to have the resources that they need. So again, they go to rageagainstaddiction.org to sign up. Yes, under events. Or to become a sponsor as well. Oh, yes. Please, 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 please sponsor. 